Good morning. We welcome you to worship with us virtually from Peace United Church of Christ in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm Reverend Kristen Pettit Miller. I'm the pastor here at Peace Church, and we welcome you on this, our first Sunday of Advent. As we gather into a time of worship, I invite you to just simply pause with me. Lower your shoulders. Take a deep breath. Allow yourself to feel God's presence around you as we come into this season of Advent which is actually the beginning of the year in the life of the church. Let us pray together. We are waiting, O God, waiting in the dark of the year. We are waiting, O God, waiting for the potter to shape our lives. We are waiting. We are waiting, O God, to see clearly what lies hidden in the darkness. We are waiting, awake and alert, ready for God to come anew. In the darkness, On this first Sunday of of Advent, a candle will be lit and this light will continue to comfort our waiting. It is the light that reminds us that one comes. Amen. As we seek the light, as the darkness grows bright, as the wonder of Christmas draws near, come, O come, Emmanuel, and join us near. Advent is a time to remember the wonders of our faith. Advent is a time to be amazed at God's wondrous love. Advent is a time to retrace our past and reclaim the hope of our future. Advent is a time to be awed by God's unfolding into creation yet today. We remember in this season that God has done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Today, we as a church light the first candle. It reminds us that the season of Advent is a time of unspeakable wonder. As we begin our Advent journey, let us stand amazed at the promise God has fulfilled, the love God has shown, and the joy God has given through the promise of the Christ child. We light this first candle, the candle of wonder. wonder in the hope of the birth of a king. There is wonder in the sound of the angels as they sing. Oh, come, oh, come, The scripture reading for the first Sunday of Advent is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, 
verses 1 through 11. In those days John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Thus ends our scripture reading for today. This year, our pandemic year, hopefully just this one year, as I considered what Advent would mean for us, I found myself constantly returning to all the traditional stories. The things that I wanted to hear were the songs and the sounds of my childhood. All of the characters and vignettes that are part of what we know Christmas to be. I just needed a little bit of comfort in this season. And so throughout this Advent season, each Sunday we will be looking at a different character within the scripture. I want us to journey together into the realm of their life for us to think of what their lives can mean to us today and to remember the way that their ancient stories have shaped our story. So each week we will unearth one of these movers and shakers of the times, one of the cast of characters who heralded in the birth and ministry of the Messiah. And this morning we begin with perhaps one of the most animated of all, with John the Baptist. Now it is a strange twist of the liturgical calendar which places a lectionary story about John the Baptist as a man in his 20s or 30s preaching in the wilderness a mere Sunday or two before there will be stories about Elizabeth, his, his mother, and stories about Mary at a time when John the Baptist wouldn't yet have even been born. So I guess it's a bit of reverse foreshadowing or something. I still have yet to figure out exactly who made that decision. And at some point I'd like to sit down and talk to him about it. But I guess we shouldn't be surprised when things get a little bit wacky when John the Baptist is involved. For he is not one that we could call orthodox. 
nor would we name him king of an understatement. John wasn't your average devout Jew in the late 20s. First, there was that whole style thing he had going for him. While most men were covering up to be out of the sun by wearing soft linen or at night heavy wool robes, well, but they wouldn't wear them at the same time because that would have been taboo. But John the Baptist distinguished himself by dressing in the fur of camels, which would have been like saying that he didn't just go to the Salvation Army to shop, but that he instead went to the dump behind the Salvation Army and dug through all the treasures that the Salvation Army had thrown away. John's clothes were styled after Bedouin shepherds who dressed for protection as they were traveling through the middle of nowhere in the wild wilderness east of Jerusalem. But it wasn't a standard of dress that would have given him a sense of power and purpose in the time when he was preaching. And then we have to talk about the food he ate. Well, let's just say that he was not a gourmand in any stretch of the imagination. He wouldn't have known a balanced diet if it was placed in front of him. John subsisted on a starvation diet of mostly wild locusts, which rained down in abundance from the trees around him, and a little bit of wild honey which could easily easily be found in that area, a diet perhaps less tasty, but definitely crunchy. But more important than that was that John put from the words from his mouth that were words that were shouted. For John was John the Baptist. He was a take no prisoners, fire and brimstone, holy roller preacher with a capital P, and he minced no words as he rattled off inequities, sin, wrongs, hypocrisies, and all of those things that he was witnessing that needed to be changed in his world. He was rough around the edges, and he was not afraid of conflict. His admonitions and his prophecies were scathed and his locust-scented breath blew across the wilderness. He would have had a lot of fun with these last elections. He was, as the theologian Barbara Brown Taylor has written, God's very own air raid siren. And yet, and yet, John's message was for reaching people. For he had amassed quite a following. Barbara Brown Taylor goes on to say, a helicopter flying over the desert east of Jerusalem would have looked down on a colorful string of pilgrims that stretched from the city to an encampment by the river which was John's church, where he heard people's confessions and he renewed their hope that God had not abandoned them. The baptizer's voice was heard in the midst of the sands of nowhere. And his words had drawn the attention of not just the marginalized and the helpless, but also of the most religious, of the Sadducees and the Pharisees who loaded themselves onto their own camels to make their way out to that marginalized wilderness to listen to what this shabby hooligan was saying, or rather, who he was saying it about. Now, I want to interrupt our little story before we get into John's loud 
pulpit pounding phase, the narrative hook of the Advent story. And I want to let you in on a little secret. John the Baptist has not been my favorite Advent character. This particular forerunner of the Messiah has always scared me a little with his bombastic voice. And I have had to spend years trying to figure out why he threatens me so much. And I realized that it's because he reminds me of a long gone second cousin of mine, a loud and dear man in oversized spectacles who was always just a little bit too loud at holiday gatherings in my grandmother's small house. And whenever he pontificated on local politics, which was pretty much all he talked about, someone, he he had the kind of voice that could stir my quiet Swedish grandfather into enough of a frenzy that he would start saying words back to him like, criminy. This cousin usually was speaking about the social gospel, as I think about it now as I remember the way that he would speak. And I grew up to love him and his ideas and his passion for social justice made a huge impact in my life. But when I was little, his bluster and his passion and the way that he would sometimes spit food out of his mouth at the Christmas table would really scare me a lot. I imagine that I'm not alone. Sometimes we don't know what to do with those people who have so much passion about something that they are so thrilled with and that they believe with their whole hearts. Sometimes we want to write them off as different or strange. But maybe instead we should stop and listen a little bit. From a distance, maybe, but still listen to the power in the voice. Advent, historically, is not generally a time when we want to hear John the Baptist's loud, threatening voice, even if we are intent on preparing the way for the one who we know will be coming. For we may have different ideas. Sometimes we like our Advent warm, We like to approach the coming of the Christ child, the coming of that soft baby with cozy expectation. We like to bask in that quiet, reflective, nuanced hush, the soft, dim lights, the hushed hymns, And so on this first Sunday of Advent, it doesn't seem right that we have to have John right in our face. What sense does that make out of everything? Can't we just fast forward to the stable? Can't we just forward to that place where that soft baby lies in the crook of our neck? Can't we smell his soft hair? Can't we just breathe a sigh of relief that God chose to come to us again? And the answer is no. No, I'm sorry, my friends, we can't. We can't do that. But because before there is birth, there has to be preparation, especially for a birth like this one. To reach the place of peace There's stuff we got to do first. And John the Baptist does have a message for us to hear and understand across time and place, across distance, across wherever we are when we're watching this video. There is a truth that he speaks that we must attend to. First of all, As we unpack John's rant, we we need to remember that he was not exactly preaching to us. Matthew 
is recounting for us a little confab between John the Baptist and the Pharisees and the Sadducees who had traveled out to the wilderness to hear him speak. Those were the priestly law-abiding Jews, those who were obsessed with dotting every I and crossing every T. Those who were asking questions about the power of this unknown prophet in the wilderness. And John reminded them with mincing words that their obsession with the law and with the rules and with the politics of the day was blinding them to a few other things and that they couldn't be saved by who they knew or what prophet they followed. He reminded these priests and leaders that they seemed to be forgetting that their covenant should only be with God forgetting that it was their job to usher in the reign of God. And oh, by the way, John the Baptist seemed to say, by aligning yourself with these powerful families with big money and special interest groups for your own political gain, you've gotten a little too big for your britches. In short, John was preaching a message of hope wrapped up in a scathing rebuke, a reminder that by participating in a dry, same old, same old ritual of religion, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had forgotten to allow their faith to evolve and to grow into something new. And so John's most scathing words might not have been meant for our ears, but it doesn't mean that we can't hear them and hear something in them that we might want to attend to ourselves. But even having recognized what I just said, I'm not sure that we can quite let John off the hook. And here's where I'm going to go all John the Baptist on you, so get ready. John the Baptist has another admonition which is universal in its appeal. One which I dare think we cannot lose sight of, especially in our Advent journey in 2020, especially when we think about the ways in which our country is struggling, especially when we have so many people whose lives have been lost from the pandemic, especially when we are polarized, when we don't know how to talk to our neighbor because they may have voted differently than we did. And John's message is this, repent. Repent. It's sort of an overwhelming word, isn't it? It's not one that we hear or talk a lot about in our liberal UCC churches. Not one that I commonly preach about. To repent means to turn around. Or rather, repent means to choose to turn toward God, to choose to turn ourselves in love's direction. And what's so frightening about that? In fact, isn't that what our Creator calls us to do on a regular basis? Aren't we always supposed to be becoming new if we are Christians? What's so frightening about that word, repent? How did it get so wrapped up to become a word that we don't know what to do with? Aren't we called to hear the voice of the one who invites us to awaken, to seek light in the dark cave of our hearts, to allow ourselves to prepare a space that Christ may be born again. 
to repent, to turn ourselves to God so that we can be ready, so that we can be active participants in this community here on earth. The writer Frederick Beekner says it better than I could in his book, Wishful Thinking. He says, to repent is to come to your senses. It is not so much something you do as something that happens. True repentance spends less time looking at the past and saying, I'm sorry, than in looking at the future and saying, wow. Friends, it's the first Sunday of Advent, and it is time for us to repent, proudly repent, collectively, individually, however we might want to make peace with that. It's time for us to heed the call of our crazy Uncle John the Baptist, the one who sometimes we dismiss, the one who sometimes scares us a little bit. The one who often has the loud voice and isn't exactly the life of the party, but he is exactly who we need to hear on this first Sunday of Advent. He's the one who's still asking all the right questions for each of us. He's the one who cuts to the heart of the faith, and reminds us where our priorities lie. It's time on this first Sunday of Advent for us to turn our faces toward the light of God to make space in our souls to bear new life. May that be our goal. Just a little space, a little space. Amen. I invite you now into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we come as ragged fragments. We bring with us patches of darkness, scraps of desires, unslaked or unrealized. The memories of spaces of pain or of loss or of apathy. Holy God, we come as scattered remnants with fractured hopes and exhausted yearnings, remembering the ways in which we have turned aside from your call. Ways in which we have forgotten what it means to repent. In this darkness, O oh God, help us to seek light. In this desolation, O oh God, we seek your companionship on the journey. We stand on the threshold of waiting, O oh God. And we are slowly beckoned into the light as we prepare ourselves for the birth again of the child of peace. Transform us, O oh God, in our journeying. Help us to change gradually 
and subtly. Help us to make space for you. In the name of the Christ child who grew and become a man and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, stay awake, for God is near. Prepare your hearts, for God is near. In the darkness, one candle of hope burns brightly. And in the quiet, God's light will shine. Go from this place. Go on to your day, carrying this small light out into the world. Go in peace. Amen.